This story has an epigraph, and it's from Bruce Springsteen, Greasy Lake. It's about a mile down on the dark side of Route 88. There was a time when courtesy and winning ways went out of style, when it was good to be bad, when you cultivated decadence like a taste. We were all dangerous characters then. We wore torn-up leather jackets, slouched around with toothpicks in our mouths, sniffed glue and ether and what somebody claimed was cocaine. When we wheeled our parents' whining station wagons out into the street, we left a patch of rubber half a block long. We drank gin and grape juice, Tango, Thunderbird, and Bally High. We were 19. We were bad. We read André Gide and struck elaborate poses to show that we didn't give a shit about anything. At night, we went up to Greasy Lake. Through the center of town, up the strip, past the housing developments and shopping malls, street lights giving way to the thin, streaming illumination of the headlights, trees crowding the asphalt in a black, unbroken wall. That was the way out to Greasy Lake. The Indians had called it Wakan, a reference to the clarity of its waters. Now it was fetid and murky, the mud banks glittering with broken glass and strewn with beer cans and the charred remains of bonfires. There was a single ravaged island a hundred yards from shore, so stripped the vegetation it looked as if the Air Force had strafed it. We went up to the lake because everyone went there, because we wanted to snuff the rich scent of possibility on the breeze, watch a girl take off her clothes and plunge into the festering murk, drink beer, smoke pot, howl at the stars, savor the incongruous, full-throated roar of rock and roll against the primeval susurrus of frogs and crickets. This was nature. I was there one night, late, in the company of two dangerous characters. Digby wore a gold star in his right ear and allowed his father to pay his tuition at Cornell. Jeff was thinking of quitting school to become a painter, musician, head shop proprietor. They were both expert in the social graces, quick with a sneer, able to manage a Ford with lousy shocks over a rutted and gutted blacktop road at 85 while rolling a joint as compact as a Tootsie Roll Pop stick. They could lounge against a bank of booming speakers and trade mans with the best of them or roll out across the dance floor as if their joints worked on bearings. They were slick and quick and they wore their mirror shades at breakfast and dinner in the shower in closets and caves. In short, they were bad. Well, people like to think that Greasy Lake is in their own town. And I suppose it is. Everybody's been down to Greasy Lake. Every teenager has had the kind of experience that I'm writing about in this story. In fact, when the story first came out, a reviewer in the LA Times said, this is the quintessential LA story. But in fact, I grew up in New York. And I was thinking of a little lake uh, tucked away in the woods out there. And uh, of course, the story is not entirely autobiographical, but there are autobiographical elements in it. Um, I'm not exactly the narrator of this story, but he sure is a lot like I once was. What are the themes of this story? What is this about? It's about what all of us want, men and women, boys and girls. Uh, we want to challenge the world. We want to assert ourselves, especially as teenagers. We want to be bad. We want to see what the limits are. In this particular story, though, Perhaps you find something that's a whole lot better. Perhaps there's some place you don't really want to go. Perhaps you are innocent in some core of yourself. And in the very end, when those girls come into the lot, these guys have their tails between their legs. What does it mean? It brings you into the story to reflect on your own experiences. And everybody, as we said, has been to Greasy Lake and has had these experiences. Well, th there are comic elements, of course, of the story. And the story is self-reflexive in a way because uh, our narrator reflects on the fact that losing those keys was, was the impetus for all of what came. And I think, uh, at any rate, I find that pretty amusing in a, in a bleak way, sure. And the story has a lot of humor, but it also, as with my role model, Lonnie O'Connor, has um, a tragic dimension too. It's a reminder that, uh, that y yes, you may challenge life and the forces of nature, but they're a lot bigger than we are. And we are all ultimately doomed. <laughs> Not today, perhaps, if we're lucky, but eventually.
I never make the plot of a story in a conscious way. Each writer has his or her own strengths and weaknesses, and of course we play to our strengths. One of the strengths that I'm given, and I don't know how or why this is, is to have structure and to think of plot. Now, of course, plot is the, the essential element of all stories. A story like Greasy Lake develops through the opening that I read you, which is the setup. I went there one night. The rest of the story, that's where the plot evolves. What happened that night? Well, each of the incidents of the story strings out from that in an escalating way until we try to wrap it up and find out what happened. And you'll notice that it's not the kind of plot in which um, they all went to jail and they locked the bar, and they locked the door, the end. No, it ends on a gesture. And that gesture brings you back into the story to rethink what it means. I, uh, as a teenager, I was a musician. In fact, in my 20s and 30s, I was a musician too, as a lead singer of a band. But then I wanted to be a serious musician and I went to music college. I played saxophone and clarinet. One of the beauties of a liberal arts college is that it allows you to discover many different things and to find out who you are and what you can be. So as soon as I got there to college, I realized that I couldn't hack it. The others were so much more advanced and better than I at their instruments. So I'd always been a pretty good writer, uh, so I drifted into history. Part of the major was to take English courses. And in the first English course I took, which was in the contemporary short story, I discovered Flannery O'Connor, her um, story, A Good Man is Hard to Find. And it was a revelation for me, because here was a very funny story about a family uh, going on vacation. And it's hilarious. Uh, you've got the brat kids, the old grandmother. She sneaks her cat into the car. The, uh, her, uh, the father of the family, Bailey, is, uh, is, is overwrought and harassed like any guy on TV. And then the story turns on you and becomes utterly tragic and heartbreaking. And uh, it, was, it just woke me up. And I thought, this is an amazing thing. So I declared a double major in history and English. And in my junior year, I blundered into a creative writing class. And um, I didn't know what it was all about. Uh, in those days, creative writing teachers weren't as sophisticated as we are now. Uh, we hadn't had as much experience of it. And people didn't really have a vocabulary or know what to say. The class was taught by Krishna Vad. He was, uh, is, he is an uh, Indian novelist. He's Harvard educated. Uh, he writes his own novels in Hindi and translates them into English. Very brilliant man. Krishna never had much to say. He was just a rock of solidity. Meanwhile, I was in the class with 10 other people, all of whom were poets who wrote incomprehensible gibberish. And we were supposed to comment on this. They would read aloud and we were supposed to comment. Now, Krishna didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. I had no vocabulary for this. And really, the poems, I thought, were pretty bad. Uh, one, by the way, one of the, my fellow students was a reincarnated Egyptian princess who had the tattoo on her ankle to prove that, by the way. And so after about three weeks or so, or four weeks, Krishna said to me, well, Tom, why don't you do something? Meanwhile, in another class, we were studying the absurdist playwrights, uh, Samuel Beckett, uh, Jean Genet, and so on. And their kind of absurdist humor really appealed to me. And I felt, all right, I'll write a play. So I did. The only play, by the way, I've ever written in my life, ever after, it's been stories and novels. At any rate, the play was called The Foot. And as the curtain opens, and I had to read it aloud, but as the curtain opens, if it were performed, two parents are grieving over a coffee table, and in the middle is this little wreath of flowers and a tiny little kid's sneaker with a little raggedy sock, all bloody, and the stump of the kid's foot. And this kid, just before the play opens, has been eaten by an alligator, and the parents were pulling and pulling, and they just got the foot. And there it is, it's not sitting on the table. And so I read this, and Krishna, who had never, never even moved or breathed, began to chuckle. And so, of course, the poets who despised me began to chuckle along just to curry favor. And finally, Krishna laughed aloud, and he applauded. And I felt, this is my gig. Or as we say, métier. Students have to realize how much fun we're having when we write these stories. Um, I've never had a boss in my life. I am just like the guy in the story. I can do anything I like. 
Um, I am lucky enough to be an artist so that every day my job is to make the long commute from my bedroom through the bathroom into my office and dream for several hours a day. Uh, and my dreams become your dreams. Um, as every student watching this video knows, to write anything, that is a term paper, a short story, a poem, is to go into another space of your mind, uh, to open up your unconscious mind. And sometimes you don't get there. Sometimes it's very difficult to get there. But the experience of reading the story is the same experience as writing it. That is, you have to get into an unconscious frame of mind. We've all had the experience of picking up a story or a book and not being able to get into it. It just isn't clicking. You read the same line 12 times and you throw it aside. Maybe a week later you pick it up and you're amazed. You're right there. The writer has the same problem. Uh, the writer has to get into that state of mind. And when he or she does, the story is the result. I should say, too, that in a story like Greasy Lake or any story I've written, whether it has autobiographical elements or not, or, and whether it's strongly plotted or whether it moves through uh, you know, an association of images, nonetheless, uh, I never have any idea what it will be. Nothing, ever. It just begins, just with those first lines that I read. And I follow those lines to see what will happen. And a story like Greasy Lake might take me, perhaps, two weeks to write. The first week is pure misery. I'm an utter failure. I've never written anything in my life. My career is shot. You know, I'm suicidal. Then an idea begins to take hold. And finally, after a few days, maybe a first line. Probably when I wrote this story, I would bet that it took me several days of misery until these first lines and first paragraph came. Once that happened, the story begins to have a life of its own and begins to unravel for you over the course of many days. It might have taken a, a second week then to write the rest of it, and then a week after that to sort of polish it and perfect it and see what it means. I mean, you don't really know what the story means until you have written it and until you find out what the ending is. I never write an outline or program it or plan it. I don't think that's what artists do. Uh, perhaps if I were writing an essay, I would program it. Actually, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wouldn't even program it then. It just has to happen. Um, if my stories are strongly plotted, well, good. I mean, that's just who I am as an artist. Uh, it's nothing that I'm doing consciously. There is a kind of magic to writing. Anybody here who has written a term paper knows that there is a kind of magic to it. You don't know what it will be. You take notes. But the final product is utterly different from your initial conception of it. That's the joy of writing something. Um, I revise as I go along so that the story that you see is exactly what it was. I don't ever write scenes and change them around or anything like that. I think if I had to do that, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd be wrapped in chains in the sub-basement of the mental hospital. Um, <laughs> for me, it just happens. And it happens slowly, as I said. And I perfect each line. I, I couldn't go on if I didn't feel that what is behind me is good. And, s and at some point, the end arrives. There's no major revision after that, and there's no detailing for plot or theme or uh, symbols or anything else. They are organic. It all just happens as one whole. So I don't do any revision whatsoever beyond daily revision of each line till I think it's right. And you may notice that when I was giving you your reading, um, there is a rhythm to the language, which is so important to me. I have never composed anything without music playing. because, And I may not be consciously aware of that music, but it's there in the background. Uh, so important to me is the rhythm of a sentence. Sometimes an editor, particularly at the New Yorker, for instance, where they're very uh, persnickety, will, um, will say, well, look, you've you got to delete this word uh, to fit. And I will say, no, because I'll read it to them. It, without that particular word or those syllables, it will read flat. It, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't scan. It, it's not poetic. It's not beautiful. It doesn't have rhythm. So that is very important to me, too. So each line, as I go along, has its own natural rhythm. And again, I don't want to sound like a, a, a mystic sitting on a mountain. Uh, yes, there's a conscious control of the story. And yes, I know what I'm doing. But that control might be perhaps 10% of the brain. The 90% is open to an unconscious flow, which creates the story and its rhythms. 
the only greater art is music, where 1% of the brain is playing the instrument and 99% is pure emotion. And we get that too when we're writing. We get mainly emotion. And, uh, and that's what enables the brain to open up my brain, as pathetic as it is, and to open up and, uh, and deliver the story. And yes, yes, of course I'm surprised by things. Uh, I never know what the ending will be. And when I get there, I uh, feel a tremendous rush. Um, you may know that um, on my website, uh, tcboyle.com, there's an essay that I wrote to address this. It's called This Monkey, My Back. And in it, I am um, talking about this kind of rush of satisfaction that an artist has and comparing it to a drug addiction or a drug high. So that when you are writing a story and you have no idea what it will be, and it finally comes together, the satisfaction is extraordinary, but it's also addictive. So that when you finish it, you want to start another and have that feeling again. It's an exploration. I only do stories, by the way, uh, and novels. I don't write essays. I don't, I don't want to be a man of letters. I don't uh, write film scripts. I have no interest in anything but fiction because I want to see what it will be, where it will go, what's next. I'm always interested in what will come next because each thing is a surprise and a revelation. I was not a good student and not a good reader. I went to school at the age of four. I was a slow student. I mean, you see this elegant, beautiful man before you, but in fact, <laughs> I was a real screw up for most of my younger years. Uh, my mother taught me to read. I remember her hammering it into me at the kitchen table, but also she read aloud to me, which is one of the things that gave me the love of reading aloud to audiences, which is one of the things I do most in my life today. Um, I had great mentors and great teachers throughout my life. Our eighth grade teacher, Donald Grant, was an amateur actor. And if we were good, and we were good, on Fridays, he would read aloud to us. I will never forget that. And whenever I'm on stage, I am thinking of him. I think I began to read seriously when I went away to college. I had been just a TV kid, uh, which is why, by the way, I hate TV to this day. And, and I'm a TV virgin since 1972. Yes, I know, I miss The Simpsons and all the rest, but um, it's, a, it's a form of entertainment that irritates me because it's the only form for most Americans. But in fact, art is entertainment. Stories are entertainment. Your teacher may be explaining to you what this story means on a deeper level, or you may be decoding that yourself, and you may find tremendous satisfaction in that. Nonetheless, this is not something that happens just in the academy. Uh, we don't have to have critics to mediate between the audience. That is you, <laughs> you and, and the writer, me. Um, this is supposed to be entertainment. Um, many uh, students read my, not only my short stories, but some of my novels. Uh, one in particular, The Tortilla Curtain, many students read it uh, uh, junior year in California. I think most students read it as required reading. And often I meet them and they say to me, wow, I had to read your book. I say, really? Did they uh, shackle you to the chair and put a rag in your mouth or what? Um, <laughs> it shouldn't be uh, an exercise. It should be something that's fun. Um, and uh, an anthology is a good place to start because you can find writers whom you have nothing to do with and you don't like. And you also should find writers who turn you on. Uh, pursue more of them. Find out who they are. Read more of their work. Find similar writers. Um, it, uh, it will grow by accretion. You'll begin to, uh, to become very well educated without even thinking about it. Um, why should people care about literature? Um, to support me. <laughs> and people like me, for one thing. And so that you could be a writer also. And, uh, and to remember that it's a viable entertainment, um, as viable as any of the other major entertainments in our society. Um, yes, it requires a little bit of sophistication, the kind of sophistication you get from reading a text like this and comparing writers and just understanding what it is as entertainment, as a form of entertainment, not so much as an assignment or, uh, or drudgery. I, I should add, too, that um, you know I'm also an inventor. And uh, in my basement lab right now, I'm working on a ray that will neutralize all TV transmissions forever worldwide. So reading is going to become a lot more important to you <laughs> folks in the immediate future. <laughs>